And I wanted to ask you a question about uh, what evidence-based policymaking really looks like uh, today versus you know the aspiration that you're trying to create. Um, FP21 put out this terrific report in 2020, and you opened by setting a scene. And so you still wanted to get the readers to imagine an NSC meeting in the National Security Council where participants arrive prepared to defend their policy proposals with robust evidence from history, data, intelligence, and social science and the integrity of ideas and rigorous analysis wins out over ideology, watered down recommendations, and bureaucratic turf battles. Um, it's a really vivid image, and you're kind of helping to differentiate what things could be from maybe the not so great way that things work today or have worked over many years. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about how exactly you think that the status quo is today. Um, how does a uh, current NSC meeting work or a lower level interagency meeting? Are people not showing up with history, data, intelligence? Um, what's leading to uh, the problems that you see today? Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, it's hard to characterize the policymaking process in a single status quo uh, point here, which is, I think, part of the problem. Uh, the decision making process is idiosyncratic. It's driven by personalities. It's um, ad hoc. It depends on the policy environment and the situation, and the people in the room. Sometimes it's highly integrated and diverse. Sometimes it's very isolated and stovepiped. Uh, you have very different people with very different backgrounds making decisions in very, very different ways. Um, I should say a lot of incredibly dedicated, intelligent, wise, capable people who have dedicated their lives to public service. So nothing I say here today will be, will be trying to undermine the, the quality of intent or the dedication of our public servants for whom I have an enormous amount of respect. Uh, but this ad hoc process leaves a lot on the table. It is often enormously inefficient. It often uh, is subject to a range of very predictable biases. It's very risk averse. And when we look out at the foreign policy landscape of my lifetime, it's not exactly like we're dominating, like we're kicking butt here. It feels like things are getting harder, the world's getting more complex, and the tools that we use to try to solve those problems are getting weaker. So where do we want to go? I think uh, you know that's what we should talk about through this conversation. We should critically analyze this. This should be kind of a, a broad-based discussion that we're all having across the public policy landscape of how do we make policy better rather than just what should we do in China? The, the, of course, that's vital as well. Um, so I would say just thinking about evidence-based policymaking in the broad base is too com too complicated, it's too much. So we think about breaking that process down into its components. At the first stage, we think of information collection and knowledge management. How do we get the information that we need available to policymakers? In the second stage, we think about how do we analyze that information? There are really cutting edge, cool to tools for extracting insight from complicated, vast amounts of information that exists today. In the third stage, we think about how to make decisions based upon the best available analysis. I think there's, you know, we can dig into each one of these stage and stages, and I think we should, but uh, it's really common, I think, that, that the intel world or that policymakers and their staff will conduct a great analysis and it'll kind of be ignored. If, if it doesn't comply with the, the decision makers' priors, if it doesn't support the pre-existing position, then it's, ah, I don't really like this piece of analysis, therefore I'm going to discard it. Well, what, what good is, is great analysis if it's just discarded, if it doesn't meet the priors? I think that, off, that, that happens often. Uh, after decisions are made, we should be monitoring and evaluating these policies and learning from what works. We should be tracking against discrete goals, discrete expectations for if we do this policy, we are expecting to see these results. If we don't, that's okay. Failure is common. This is a complicated world and the enemy has a vote. But we should learn from that. We should adjust our policies. We should double down on the ones that are working, and many will work. And we should pivot away from those that fail. And then we've got to, in the final stage, push all that learning, all that good process throughout the policy, uh, the policy cycle back into the, to the staff. How do we hire the people with the right skills? How do we promote those who are accomplishing real objectives rather than just showing up and filling seats? How do we train for the new skills that we really need in the process? So you often have people say, yeah, diplomacy is an art, not a science. And, you know, we, I don't think we can talk to what's happening in, um, uh, you know, the NSC 20, circa 2022. But when you read history books of the archives that have come out, 
it's it's very pie in the sky. People are making random analogies to things, and what seems to win arguments is not subject to the level of rigor. I guess you would hope for some of these decisions, which um, you know have world-shattering consequences. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's a real there's a great field of study um, called analogic thinking and all the dangers of of comparing everything to, you know, everything's about Vietnam or everything's about the Gulf War. Everything was about World War II and uh, how poor of a decision-making framework, how inaccurate that this can be. Um, yeah, I think that the skill often most valued in the foreign policy world yeah. is narrative and storytelling. Telling a good story and having great communications is vital. We, we know that. This is about democracy. This is about communicating to the American people. And it's about being able to tell a cohesive, logical story. That's all important. But if narrative gets in the way of hard analytical rigor, if narrative trumps rigor, you get yourself in big trouble. I remember interning decades ago at the State Department and everyone was like, Jordan, you're a really good writer. You'd be great here. And I was just thinking like, really? Like writing is what gets me great. You can be a great writer and have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but the mm. fact that like the, these cables, like the ones that get passed around are the ones that have like the juicy, like journalistic -y goodies, not the ones that have very interesting kind of like, you know, real, uh, you know, grease and legwork and, and kind of rigor into them, um, was, was a, was a lesson that I've not, I've not lost in the, in the subsequent decade. Yeah, I think that's right. Foreign policy decision makers tend to be excellent writers. And excellent briefers. Gosh, I learned so much at the State Department from really great briefers who just, you know, I've got 30 seconds with the boss and I'm going to nail the point. Often the best analysts are terrible briefers. It's like, well, you know, there are shades of gray. There's this and that. There's, you know, got to weigh this evidence. I'm not sure about this piece, 60% probability on this piece. That makes terrible briefing. It makes terrible writing. It just so happens to make really great decision making and analysis, unfortunately. Is that your experience? You've served at, at high levels, John. Well, I, I don't want to say high levels, but whatever level I was at, I experienced all of the issues that you described, Dan. Um, I mean, starting in the intelligence community, I, I'm somewhat embarrassed at times to kind of um, uh, pitch myself as an expert on the things that I was supposedly analyzing in the IC, um, not because the quality of the analysis was, was poor. We were able to do a decent job institutionally, but you know, any one of us really lacked access to the kind of thick expertise that exists in academia and civil society on the ground. Um, it was definitely through a looking glass darkly. And as you describe, all of that trickles upward into senior level meetings, which may lack structure and um, just go based on the, the predilections of, of those principles. So maybe one question is, if all of us who have served in the government are so painfully aware of these problems, what are institutions or organizations now or in other places or times in history that have done this well? I mean, because sometimes you just hear the claim that you know, human beings need stories or there's, there's limits to the complexity of our thought, the politics that you describe are just perennial problems in human decision making. 